<laughs> hey, this is Warren Redlick. I'm here with Emmett Peppers, Emmett Peppers of Good Soil Investment Management. That's right. Okay. And before we get started, Emmett's going to speak a disclosure. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Warren. So whatever we talk about in this podcast is not investment advice or to be taken as investment advice in any way, shape or form. Uh, we're just talking our own thoughts and streams of consciousness, as Dave puts it sometimes. And I agree. Uh, first of all, let's be clear. I am not a professional investment advisor. I don't give prof I don't know your personal situation, you who are watching or Emmett. I don't know your personal situation. If you want financial advice, you should probably talk to a professional investment advisor. I do have a video on this channel where I, I think I called it something like Investing 101, which was aimed at my children, who, of course, refused to watch it, but with some basic investment <laughs> well, advice. Yeah, yeah. Well, children don't watch, want to do anything. My kids might be older than yours, though. That's so. true. All right. Yeah. So I want to get into some topics. So the first topic I have in mind is Tesla. Obviously, you and I are both big Tesla investors. We talk about Tesla a lot. I want to ask you about Tesla, about ARK Invest, about full self-driving and about Dojo in this part of the video. And we'll move on to some other topics later. So what are your general thoughts on Tesla, the company right now and Tesla, TSLA, the stock? Yeah, I love both. I mean, I think the Tesla company um, is firing on, on all cylinders, executing very well. I think they're poised to become the largest company uh, in the world by both revenue and market capitalization by the end of this decade. I'm pretty highly convicted in that, whether it's in the next two or three years or 2026, 2027 or 2030, I don't know, but I'm pretty confident by the end of the decade that will happen. Um, now, from the stock point of view, you know, the stock has run up like 15x in the last 18 months or something like that. Ridiculous, right? And, and, and to be fair, it was lagging for a long time. Like the, it was artificially held down by shorts and FUD narratives and stuff for, for, from 2014 to 2019. And it probably should have been higher in 2019 than where it was, in my opinion. That's why I was investing in it, especially in buying long-term options at the time and such. And um, I finally bounced up and like overcorrected, in my opinion, over went up like 750 billion market cap is huge. You know, that's like one of the top companies in the world, right? Bigger than like almost all auto, all automakers combined. So there's, it's really big, the market capitalization. You have to kind of, I have to keep that in my mind when I think of the stock, even though the company I am so impressed with, you know, I'm not convinced the stock's going to double or triple anytime soon. Um, you know, that would be one or two trillion market cap. Then it would be like the biggest company in the world, you know, and I think that'll happen. I think it could be a five trillion plus market cap, you know, within a few years if they execute well and get full self driving down. But I don't see another 10x run up in, in, you know, a 12 to 18 month period, you know, ever happening again in Tesla, to be honest. So I feel like there's a lot of uh, misnomers. A lot of people don't look at market caps enough in investing. They kind of just look at stock prices and they think it's just like arbitrary. And yeah, $700, $50 is an expensive looking stock price. Amazon's an expensive looking stock price, you know, 3000 plus, you know, Nvidia just split the $200 seems cheap, but it's still expensive. It's 500 billion market cap. So it's really about market caps in my mind. I kind of wish there was no, no such thing as stock prices and everything was just quoted in market caps. I think that would uh, make the playing field a lot more even for people to think about investing in stocks. Um, but I try to use that to my advantage and to some degree. Um, anyway, so the stock, I don't see, even if the company executes really well and deliveries are out of this world next few quarters, I'm not sure the stock's going to double or, or go up more than a thousand bucks in my opinion, but it's possible. I'm just not expecting it. I mean, I, I personally think they undercorrect. I agree with you at the part that they were un, uh, unnaturally suppressed in 2019. And I'm very unhappy about that because I bought so much stock in 2019 at low <laughs> prices. It was very upsetting for me. Yeah, I yeah. continued to buy in 20 and 2021, even as it went up. I still own all my Tesla, most virtually all my Tesla, by the way. I'm not selling Tesla, but anyway, go on. I, no, I have never sold a share. I still, I still have not sold a share. I bought probably more than 20 times in uh, my own account and two family accounts and have never sold a share. So, and I, I just to be clear, I think it undercorrected. <laughs> I still think it has a lot of valuation. I guess I would, here's, let me ask you this question early about Tesla. Where do you see Tesla? If you look out in the distant future, let's say 2025 or 2030, I don't know what time frame you use. If you were to pick a time frame somewhere between 2025 and 2030, have you, do you have any kind of estimate of what it will be worth then? And what year would you pick? 
for me, I kind of, I'm trying to be conservative with 2030, you know, nine, 10 years out of the decade. And I'm very confident it'll be largest company in the world. And at that time, the largest company in the world may, is probably going to be in the five to 10 trillion market cap range, at least. Um, so that's where I kind of put Tesla, the market cap at that time. I don't think it'll be a smooth upward transition there though. Like we could be stuck in a range of ground of, you know, 500 billion to a trillion market cap from here till 2025, for example, and then it doubles one year suddenly after that, you know, it's, stocks are erratic, they're not, they don't move in line with the company's fundamentals, as we saw from 2014, to 2019, you know, so that's my hesitancy and people, you know, I used to do this too, and I want to do this where I want to like buy the stocks based on their business revenues going up. And, you know, for mature stocks, that makes sense. But for really high growth stocks that have, you know, enormous potential, it's very different. If you magnify out to like, you know, a 10 year window, it makes a lot of sense. But when you look at one year or day to day, especially, I think of it as like quantum entanglement. I was reading about quantum entanglement <laughs> and like an analogy is like, if you look at one or two letters of a page of a book, it doesn't, you know, when you look at the letters back to back, it doesn't make any sense. But when you look at the whole page, it makes more sense. If you look at the whole chapter, it makes more sense and so forth. So sort of like with day-to-day -day stock movements, one day versus another, you can't make sense of it really. One month to another, you can hardly make sense of it. And for Tesla, which is like a generational, generational stock, it's like bigger than Apple when you look back in history, I think, for sure. And so when you look at it from that perspective, to me, it takes, it's a bigger book. So you have to look at like, not one page or another, it's like a whole chapter versus another, you know, it's like the quantum entanglement is bigger. So from year to year, the price stock price might not make any sense, even if their revenues increased 3x or something. But when you look at over five or 10x, it'll make a lot of sense. Five or 10 year period, it will make a lot of sense. That's my opinion. All right. So it sounds like I am much more bullish than you are on Tesla in the long term. <laughs> well, <laughs> long term, I don't know. I think long term, I'm stock. bullish too. I'm bullish long term. But I'm saying short term, I'm not as bullish. No, maybe. I mean, I mean, my 2030 number is much higher than 10 trillion. Okay. What's my, your my, number? my 2026 number is 20 trillion. So. Oh wow. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, if I, self driving goes super great. I'm not. I'm not. That's not possible. I just don't think it's probable. But it's possible for sure. So, so let's go with instead of the stock. Let's talk about the business fundamentals. Where do you see Tesla in terms of like what's the most important fundamental? Pa uh, things to look at for Tesla in the next two to three years? What is it deliveries? Is it FSD? Is it um, profit margin? What, what kind of numbers are you looking at that you think are big drivers for the results? Yeah, FSD for sure is the biggest option on Tesla. Um, I don't think that's even necessary to become the biggest market cap company in the world, you know, um, but I think in terms of it getting to like the 10 trillion market cap by 2025, that possibility, FSD is necessary, you know, to really become full, like fruition, like legalized, you know. Um, so I think that's the software unpacking potential gross margin, you know, margins of Tesla. And um, I think uh, the 4680 uh, production is next after full self-driving. And then um, their future products, you know, how whether it's the humanoid or the supersonic EV tall, I think they're going to come out with later in the decade, which I'm the most excited about, you know, I'm that's just the coolest thing to me. I, I think Elon's got that in his mind. And, you know, I think at some point they're going to put that together, but uh, the, the, the future products and it, it is the next thing too, that that's going to increase devaluation things that we don't even know about yet. Like, you know, we, not many people knew the humanoid was a legitimate possibility until a few weeks ago, right? Yeah, James Dama called it. Nobody else did. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, he called it in, like a year ago. He, he suggested it as a possibility. Yeah. All right. Let me let me throw some ideas out for you about where what I think are some key fundamentals, and tell me what you think about this. The number one thing people seem to talk about, in my experience, when they're trying to value Tesla, is deliveries. It's a very popular. It, I think it's because it's a number we get before the earnings call. So it's yeah. like something we can all hold on to. We yeah, can yeah. predict this is what deliveries are going to be. And then this yeah. is what that's what's going to happen to the earnings. And, and so when we see the deliveries, then we can update our prediction for the earnings. So it's almost like it's a number that's readily available so we can work with it. So I want to step forward to let's say 2024. Okay. No, I want to go to 2026. That's my favorite year. So okay. I think when I look at the factories that we know about, the factories and products that we're aware of that we know about, which is basically Fremont, Giga, Shanghai, 
Giga Berlin and Giga Texas producing threes, Ys, Xs, Ss, and cyber trucks. Yep. I don't really worry so much about semi and roadster because they're low volume. They're not a big impact on the, the company's uh, profits. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm leaving out energy for the moment. Oh, I think energy becomes important at some point. So what, what I see is the factories that we know about. I'm leaving out the battery day 2020, you know, uh, 2023 Tesla Compact Model 2, Tesla Q, whatever people want to call it. I'm leaving that one out. So from the stuff that we know about, I think they could hit 6 million deliveries by 2025 or 2026. I think that's possible for sure. And I'll just lay out the explanation. Shanghai is basically approaching a pace of 600,000 vehicles a year right now. Mm -hmm. Fremont can probably hit 600,000 vehicles a year almost right now. So that's 1.2 million between those two. I think they grow to 1.5 between them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 750 each, maybe more than that, but let's call it. I think Shanghai goes higher. I think they add the expansion pack, the expansion land on the Shanghai. I think that'll go more likely go higher faster but before 2026. But well, no, the expansion land might be for the compact. So I'm, I'm a little fuzzy on that. I think, yeah. I think that Fremont and Shanghai scale more because they convert their lines over to front and rear castings and structural pack. And that mm -hmm. makes them more productive, but just going. So, so call me conservative when I say those two factories produce 1.5 million. Yeah. That's conservative. I would say okay. together. Then you get to giga Berlin, which I think might reach 2 million vehicles a year. I think it's going to produce model Y and model three. And I think it reaches 2 million a year. And I think yep. giga Texas does more than 2 million a year, leaving out the future compact, just model three model Y and cyber truck. Yeah. I think it probably does 2.5 million a year more. So those 1.5 plus two plus 2.5 gets you to 6 million a year. And so that's, so that's for 2026 for those factories. But in 2023 or now, I think maybe pushed to 2024, Tesla starts building the factories for the battery day vehicle. I see Tesla building at least three factories at the same time. That these, the next generation factory is going to be more productive than Berlin or Texas, right? So Fremont is generation zero, Giga Shanghai is generation one, Berlin and Texas are being built at the same time, they're generation two. The next generation vehicle is gonna be built in next generation factories. Elon talked about it with Sandy Monroe. And I think there will be at least three of them built at the same time, maybe a fourth at Giga Osaka, maybe they go for Giga India or Giga Brazil. And those factories are gonna produce more than 2 million vehicles a year each. I think those factories produce 4 million vehicles a year each. Again, my conservative estimate yeah is that they build three factories each producing four million vehicles a year each wow right which is another 12 million and and if they start in 2023 or late 2023 early 24 they may be fully ramped by 2026 and be producing 12 million vehicles a year and it could be four factories producing three million vehicles a year instead of three factories producing four million vehicles a year right it doesn't have to be yeah, um, yeah the other yeah. way and so you end up with 18, I come with 18 million vehicles a year in 2026. Wow. And that, even without robo-taxi, leads to a really, really big jump in valuation. Sure. Right? And, and you could say, Warren, that's too soon, or Dave doesn't think they're going to build more than one factory at a time. And I, I was like, they're building two factories at the same time right now. But, you know, <laughs> I think that happens. And I think the battery supply is no longer a problem because they're going to use lithium iron phosphate, which... CATL is ramping like crazy. And LG Chem, I think, is also... LG Chem is ramping something like crazy. I think they're going to ramp lithium iron phosphate as well. I mean, okay, so does that sound... It sounds... I understand it's aggressive, but does it sound crazy to say they could produce... Now, Dave's issue is more on the demand side that he doesn't know if there's enough demand for those vehicles. But on yeah. the production side, does it sound crazy they could achieve that? I think in the best of best case scenarios, it's possible. But a lot has to go right, a lot. And not just demand, um, but especially the battery supply, which you referenced. You know, CATL, it's a monstrous company. The iron phosphate's very helpful. But these batteries, not to mention the chips, look at all the chip shortages we have now, right? Um, that's but, the big hurdle. Right now, that's yeah. the big hurdle. I think batteries and chips, uh, chips are, you know, but hopefully the chips are being worked out. But um, batteries, like that, that implies to me like a 10x volume increase in battery production, you know, between now and then, which is huge. You know, the 4680s have to go really well, in my opinion. And it's possible. It's the best of best case scenarios is what I would say. Well, so my take on that is that 
the battery day vehicle I'm talking about was pitched at battery day as lending, running a lithium iron phosphate. And CATL has said that targeting 1.2 terawatt hours by 2020, I think it was 2026, which okay. is a lot of batteries. And yes. the battery day vehicle is probably going to be extremely efficient and maybe only need a 40 kilowatt hour pack. My, my ballpark guess for the battery day vehicle is if they can achieve eight miles per kilowatt hour. No forget a, though, the Chinese uh, producers are going to ramp up as aggressively as possible as well. And they're going to get a huge supply from CATL as well, I think. Well, BYD is going to ramp up on BYD cells. Yeah. Um, certainly, well, 1.2 terawatt hours is so much. How I many vehicles is that? I don't even know. For 40 well, uh, kilowatt one, hour. Battery. One gigawatt hour, yeah. right, would be, let's well, say one megawatt hour would be 40, would be 25 vehicles at 40 kilowatt hours a vehicle, right? So one gigawatt hour is 25,000 vehicles and one terawatt hour is 25 million vehicles. Okay. okay. And that's just CATL. That doesn't include four. And they're going for 1.2. So it's really like 30 million vehicles. Plus you've got Tesla's own 4680 production plus LG Chem. LG Chem is trying to keep up with or stay ahead of CATL. So they could do another terawatt hour. Mm -hmm. And then you've got SK and EVE and BYD. So there's a lot of battery production coming. And the thing about lithium iron phosphate is it doesn't really require a lot of innovation to make a cylindrical lithium iron phosphate cell. They're already doing it. It's mm -hmm. the only innovation is scaling production. Yeah. So maybe they go, maybe I think tablets helps increase the velocity of the battery production lines, but yeah. And it's already inexpensive. I just remember the years it would take Panasonic to ramp up and maybe because Panasonic's Japanese and maybe they're more perfectionist. I don't know. Maybe it's just a slower ramp versus the Chinese companies that can more aggressively think, ramp up. But uh, it just, it just takes longer than it. In my opinion is, these battery ramping things are more complex than we realize, and it takes longer. The Gigafactory took in Nevada took year; it's, it's still not fully capacity. And I remember hoping, oh, this year it'll be ready. This year, next year, and it's just like slowly kind of ramping up, not nearly as fast as as you know. When I was in 2013, 2014, I was kind of like very bullish on Tesla, and I always have been. But the battery ramp up has always lagged, in my opinion, versus what I thought as a bull, as a Tesla bull. Okay, so I agree with you that there's a lot of, especially supply chain, a lot. Um, I think the chip thing's gonna be worked out. I have a hunch that when they engineer the next generation vehicle, the battery day vehicle, they're gonna find a way to engineer it so it doesn't need as many chips and so that they have a secure supply of chips. Like I think yeah. Elon said for us to do a fab would require 12 to 18 months in advance. Well, 12 to eight month, 18 months is too long for Model Y but yeah. it's not too long for the battery day vehicle. So yeah. I almost saw that like, oh crap, they're going to build a chip factory. <laughs> they're going to yeah, build their own chips. That they were considering it. And I believe that's true. Maybe. Well, if they want to secure the supply chain for the battery day vehicle, I think they have to make their own chips for the battery day vehicle. And then they can really re-engineer the whole chip sets, the whole chip architecture for the vehicle, because it's a totally new vehicle. And yeah. they can go from 40, I don't know how many chips are in a car, but they can go from 40 chips to six. Yeah. Right, They just make chips that are more capable. I think there's a lot of potential there. So another angle to look at Tesla is the robo-taxi story. Mm -hmm. Elon said at Autonomy Day that they're going to have robo-taxis. And he, somebody asked him this. He said they expect to have a fleet of 10 million vehicles of their own to fill in the areas where privately owned vehicles are not serving. And I think he was sandbagging there. But let's go with Tesla has a fleet of 10 million vehicles. Okay. And I'll just give you my numbers which okay. you may or may not have heard before. Right now, Uber charges about 250, Uber and Lyft cost about 250 a mile to the passenger. Okay. So I think at 10 million vehicles, they're probably getting the cost down to the passenger to a dollar a mile or so. And their cost of operating the vehicle is probably going to be down to around 10 cents a mile or so. This is the Tesla owned fleet. I'm leaving out the privately owned vehicles, which is another source of revenue and profit that I'm leaving out. Okay. So I get 90 cents in profit per mile. And it, I think they do 100,000 miles a year and they only get paid for 60,000 miles, right? Because they optimize the network. They do better than 50% of miles driven or paid. And so that would be um, 60,000 miles times 90 cents a mile works out to about over $50,000 in profit per vehicle, gross profit, not net profit, about 54,000 in gross profit per, um, per vehicle per year. And okay. that's $540 billion in gross profit 
Wow, that's impressive. Yeah. That and, number. And, and those are pretty simple numbers. James Dalma, I was talking to him, or maybe he was talking to Dave, and his numbers were higher. Mm -hmm. um, and I've talked to some other people who think, I talked to somebody else who thought that the dollars per mile will be higher and the number of miles they'll get paid for and the number of miles they'll drive will be higher. Because I figure they can run, let's say, 18 hours a day. Between midnight and 6 a.m., there's not a lot of rides. Yeah. Right. But between 6 a.m. and midnight, even though there are peaks at rush hour, there's actually a pretty heavy volume for that whole 18 hour window. So I, I think over 18 hours a day, if they're driving, they average 20 miles, uh, 200 miles a day, uh, sorry, 20 miles an hour, then okay. you get to 360 miles, right? And 360 times 365 is over 100,000 miles a year. Some people think they're going to do more than that. Maybe they average a higher speed. So I just come up with these crazy numbers like $540 billion in gross profit, figure it's 400 billion or 350 billion in net profit. And you apply any kind of reasonable price earnings ratio to that, leaving out everything else that Tesla's doing. Yeah. Right. You know, if you say 400 billion in net profit and you give it, and the price earnings ratio is 50, which I don't think is crazy for a company growing that fast. Yeah. I think that's a $20 trillion company. I don't think the price earnings will be 50 for such the largest company in the world. Grow, even though it's growing fast, people will be hesitant to think it can double or triple quickly again. I, I think it would be more like a 20 multiple, in my opinion, when it's the largest company in the world. But I think that the numbers you're putting forth other than that are totally realistic for 2030. Um, I'm just no, not no, sure. I wasn't talking about 2030. Okay, okay. I was at 2026. Yeah, I know you're talking about 2026. I think they're perfectly realistic for 2020, 2030, but I, I'm, not, I'm skeptical that that all is achieved by 2026. That's all. Okay. So on, on price earnings ratio, Amazon is one of the largest companies in the world and their price earnings ratio is I think 70. Okay. So I think, I think a 50 price earnings ratio is conservative. Amazon is much further down its path of growth than Tesla is, then Tesla will be in 2026. Amazon today is probably 10 years further down the path mm -hmm. than Tesla will be in 2026. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I think, I think Amazon started became, being consistently profitable in 2014, and we're seven years from that now. Tesla became consistently profitable maybe last year or maybe yeah, just recently. So seven years from now would be 2028. So I'm still at 2026. I'm only five years or, you know, I, I, I think they're not, now the curve may be moving faster too, right? Everything's yeah, growing yeah, yeah, faster. Yeah. So the curve might be shortening, but okay. So what about Apple? what's their price to earnings right now? They're around 35 or 30. I think they're 30. Yeah. But they're much right. further down that curve, right? Apple started in the seventies or eighties. Yeah, I agree. But I, I think Tesla will be perceived as being around where Apple is today in 2030, unless there's some huge new products unveiled that are still like growing magnanimously in 2030 on with the bots, the armies of bots they'll be making maybe by then and the, the, the supersonic EV talls and whatever else is being cooked up that we don't know about. When you talk about being perceived, what I would say is obviously their perceptions matter, but what we will see is, well, how fast did they grow last year to this year? What's the forecast for growth? PE isn't determined, price earnings ratio is not generally thought of as determined by how the company is perceived. It's determined by how fast do I think that company is growing? There's even a term called price earnings gross ratio, the yeah. peg ratio. So if Tesla is still growing fast at that point, which I think it will be, right? Because let me be yeah. clear. I think the robo-taxi network grows to 100 million or more vehicles. Yeah, I think the 50% growth on average per year is what Elon has quoted, right? And I think they're going to grow greater than 50% on average for the next five years. But for the last half of this decade, I think it's maybe on average lower than 50%. Maybe by 28, 20, 28, 29, it'll be like 30% per year. And so it'll be perceived as slowing down a little bit and the PE right. will come in line. Right. So I, I would say this, if they hit 18 million vehicles by 2026, then I think the, the upper number for how many vehicles they can actually deliver starts yeah. to become it the, the growth in delivery starts to become challenging yeah but the growth in robo taxi rides is just beginning mm -hmm. because i think the market like that's 10 million robo taxis i think the market for robo taxis is more than 100 million yeah so there's still a lot of room to grow in terms of robo taxis and then 2026 we're going to know a lot more about tesla bot yeah and the, you know dave's going crazy about what he thinks like i this is the first time i saw dave get almost unhinged <laughs> when he was talking about Tesla bot, like, yeah, he, he no, said some things. It, yeah. If you check out, 
sorry for the, for those who are watching check out my channel i just did an interview with dave lee a couple of days ago if you're watching this now and or a couple of days before this video goes public and toward, later in the video probably more than halfway through the video dave starts talking about tesla bot and he went a little crazy for dave especially he went crazy <laughs> you have a plaid model s i'm going to ask you more about it later but you have fsd on your plaid model s I do, but not full self driving beta. I don't have the beta version. Okay, so you have Navigate on autopilot. Yeah. And exactly. you've certainly watched a lot of FSD beta videos. Yes. What are your thoughts on where FSD beta is now and how fast do you think it might improve? Well, I mean, I think they're about to release, you know, as we record this, I think tonight is when they release this new version 10. Um, so that's what I'm super excited about. Like, this is a big beacon right here, this for version 10. Like, I'm going to watch a lot of these videos and um, try to assess the step improvement between the last version and this new version that kind of Elon sort of talked up a little bit. Um, now, I know Elon's using a more advanced version, like 10.2 or something that's a little bit better than this one that's being released tonight. But he has talked about this one being released tonight as being like, a huge step change forward. So I want to see that myself from other people driving it. Um, I'm going to talk to Dave. I'm going to talk to Chuck Cook. Uh, Chuck Cook, other... I love. Yeah, yeah Vincent. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that I know that use the full self-driving beta. I want to get their opinions on it. Um, so to me, this is like a turning point. Is full self-driving ready for prime time for the masses in the next one or two years, or is it still uncertain? Like, is it improved, but it's not clear that it's like a step change, just kind of some minor improvements and maybe behind the scenes or step change improvements, but we can't verify it ourselves. We're not programmers, coders or whatever. It, it's going to bring about the level of uncertainty I have about full self-driving to be less uncertain or more uncertain, I guess. And uh, I hope I'll be more certain that we're much closer than my conservative estimates for yeah. full self-driving being ready for the masses. I, I will what, say this. I think the thing about beta 10 is it's when Elon talks about a step change or how it's improved. I don't think he's talking about the driving experience. I don't think he's only talking about the driving experience that the, the driver will have watching it drive the car and whatever. I think it's actually more about how fast it learns, which is harder for us to see. That mm -hmm. now that they're going to one stack rules them all. For those who don't know, we I, we expect that FSD beta ten previous versions of FSD have had navigate on autopilot on the highway and one version of FSD beta running for city streets yeah. and then some other like smart summit or something that running in parking lots. And I believe the goal with best with beta ten is one stack to rule them all. That FSD beta drives everything, and that increases the miles that it learns from and um, and more than. And I think it also the way that navigate on autopilot works, the way that um, the parking lots work is doesn't learn as fast. So a lot of the, the negative experiences people may be having may not be. And so it's really hard to grasp. Like I was riding with Tesla Tino, Raphael from Tesla Tino in FSD to beta 9.1. We're driving down the road. We're in the, the middle lane and there's these cones on the right, separating the right lane from the two, two lanes to the left. And there's a big sign flashing arrow pointing left in the right lane. Yeah. And FSD beta tried to steer into the right lane. And it, you could see on the, on the user interface, it identified that as a, the back of a tractor trailer. And we were, going, we were about to make a right turn. Hmm. Right? But we, because, the, because the lane was closed, we were forced to go middle lane. And I think it's one of those things where that's an edge case. It has to learn that edge case. It has to learn that that object is a flashing left arrow. Yes. Right. There's certain things it has to learn in that situation. And so... If it learns those things faster, we don't see the speed of learning as clearly when we're sitting behind the wheel or we're watching an FSD beta video, but the people at Tesla see it. The, the guys on the AI team, they see something we don't see. So I'm a little unsure when he says step change, whether it's user experience or speed of learning, which we don't observe. Do you have any thoughts on that? I agree with you. Yeah. It's unsure whether it's something behind the scenes that's a step change and there's speed of learning or a user experience. I thought he meant user experience, but, you know, I can't, I don't know. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see how it progresses and you'll have people like James Dalma and such be able to kind of decode more of the underpinnings, perhaps, you know, if there's a step change on that. Things like that flashing yellow, flashing arrow, changing the architecture of the software isn't going to solve that problem and has to learn it. 
it, it, there's so many edge cases it has to learn. It's just a question of how fast can it learn those edge cases? Just, did you have any thoughts on Dojo? Uh, the Dojo chip or Dojo? The, whole, uh, the Dojo chip, the Dojo tile, the Dojo computer. Did you have yeah. any thoughts on what that is, where it goes, how it plays out for the company, both in terms of FSD and otherwise? Yes, um, I am not. A, I know I'm not a chip expert in any by any shape means, or you know, I know that I know I'm not an expert on most of these Tesla related things. I know enough to be a generalist and know who the experts are to kind of like inform my overall opinion on things with Tesla. And so, with regards to the chip, what was interesting is um, Galley did a, a roundtable kind of discussion with uh, James Wang, formerly from Mark Invest, who's kind of a chip expert, and then some other people's, a few chip experts. And he did a big discussion and they talked about it for a while. And there was one guy that was like, almost seemed anti, not anti Tesla, but he was just super skeptical saying there's nothing better than what's already out there with NVIDIA's and, uh, and such. And I couldn't tell whether I disliked what he was saying because it was like going against my own bias of being a big Tesla, you know, believe, I'm, you know, amongst Tesla bulls, I might not be a Tesla bull, but per the general community, I'm a, definitely a Tesla bull. And this guy was like, not a general community Tesla bull. He was kind of just like a skeptic, you know, thinking that they're 2028 20, till they have their full self-driving and he thinks Waymo is going to do it first. And just don't know. So I couldn't tell, I'm trying to test my own kind of like, you know, beliefs. Like I know I'm not a chip expert. This guy sounds like he is. Uh, and he's saying that this chip isn't anything too special. It's not going to move the needle too much. But at the same time, the other chip experts didn't seem to challenge him enough on his uh, statements. And I just couldn't tell, like, is Tesla's AI chip really revolutionary or is it nothing that special? And there's three possibilities. Either Elon is intentionally deceiving us, which I don't think is a possibility and hyping it up over much. Or Elon doesn't know as much as this guy, Naveen, um, on this table, which I don't think is the possibility. Or this guy, Naveen, you know, doesn't fully understand it himself and he thinks he knows more than Elon. And I think that's the most likely scenario because that seems to be, have always been the most likely scenario. Anything technology or AI related with regards to Elon, you know, so... Um, you know, I, I want to understand more skept, more chip experts. I really would love to see Jim. I think Jim Keller is the guy's name who uh, worked with Elon and Tesla in the past. Uh, I, I hope he comes out with some kind of interview with Lex Friedman or just goes into a little bit of a detailed reaction of the Tesla AI chip. So I, my opinion isn't fully formed yet, I guess is what I'm saying. Like I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that it's like revolutionary, but I'm not it's not fully formed. I'm waiting for more information. What, what are your thoughts about it? Well, I'm going to go watch that roundtable, but um. I think it's it's funny you mentioned that this guy thinks he knows more than Elon. It's like it's not just Elon. It's Ganesh. Yeah. It's uh, Andre Karpathy. It's Ashok. There's a team at Tesla. Yeah. And they're all on the same page. It's not like and this is one of those things where like when Elon says we're going to do this in six months and nobody else on the team says it. Yeah. OK. But when Elon says we're going to have Starship fly Earth to Earth flights taking people from point A to point B. Yeah. And you're like, oh, okay, Elon's just talking. And then Gwyn Shotwell's on the TED, you know, being interviewed on a TED talk. And she yeah. says, oh, no, that's definitely going to happen. Yeah. And he's like, well, when's that going to happen? 10 years. He says, is that Elon time or is that Gwyn time? And Gwyn says, <laughs> well, I'm sure Elon wants us to do it faster, but I'm saying 10 years. And that yeah. was two years ago. So Starship Earth, Earth is coming in eight years. And that's yeah. my, my point is that if somebody else on the team is saying the same thing with, conv with convincing in a convincing way, like I think Drew Baglino is more optimistic about 4680 than Elon is. If yeah. you listen to them talking in like the Q2 earnings call, the Q1 earnings call, I hear Drew being more confident than Elon about 4680 progress. And Elon yeah. tweeted this morning something about metallurgy. And no what one knows. What do you think that's about? I don't know. What do you have? I think you... that's about the calendar roller in the 4680 cell production, that they were having an engineering problem with the, the, the thing that, that was rolling out the cathode yeah, material. Like Mm -hmm. was having a problem. It was getting dented or something like that in the process. And they needed to do some kind of engineering to solve that problem. And people are like, oh, he means cyber. They mean he's talking about cyber truck. I'm like, cyber truck is stainless steel. That's not really complicated. They've already settled. I mean, they did some really important metallurgy in developing cyber truck stainless steel and starship stainless steel, but they already solved that problem pretty much. That wasn't like holding anything up. What does metallurgy even mean? I don't even know. Like it's what, the what material you... science of making metals and figuring okay. out the properties of metals and getting metals to do what you want them to do that people didn't know it could do so there was substantial metallurgy in delivering 
the stainless steel for Cybertruck and Starship. Okay. Um, I, I might, this might be two actually different alloys of stainless steel, but I think it was with Starship. They had to be able to achieve this ability to handle really high temperatures and really cold temperatures and still be strong. And there were certain things they did to manipulate the alloys in the stainless steel for Starship. And I don't, I'm not 100% sure that's the same stainless steel going into Cybertruck because Cybertruck won't be exposed to the same high heat and the same cold. Yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, so that, but I think that metallurgy problem was already basically solved. So that calendar roll thing, that, that was, that's the one metallurgy problem I knew they had. So mm. that's my theory. That'd that be good. Stuff. I hope yeah. that's, that's, that's the biggest uh, pushback with the, with the ramping up, I think, as, yeah. as I understand it. Okay. So I want to move on to the next thing. The thing that I wanted, the, I want to move on to the thing that got me to ask you to come on this channel. Sure. So let's talk about this. You had a tweet where you talked about Tesla being a really, really large company, but you also talked about Starlink. Yes. Being one of the largest companies in the world. I agree with you. I have my reasons why I believe that. What are your reasons for thinking Starlink gets so big? Starlink, uh, I actually have one myself. I haven't uh, plugged in. We had our solar roof put on in our house recently and we had to take off some dishes. So I need to get someone to put the Starlink dish on our roof in the right place now. Um, so I'm looking forward to set that up again, but it works. It functions. I can confirm and verify, you know, uh, and um, this is the first iteration I have product, you know, this is a huge dish, you know, and I see the pace of innovation Tesla does. And I've talked about it with Dave in the past and he's not so sure, but I think with the pace of innovation Tesla has, they're going to innovate just as they have to not need ground stations now. You know, Elon Musk had that funny tweet about like, you know, in other countries of the world, we'll be able to beam internet to anyone and all the, the government can do is shake their fist at the sky. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> so, so everyone's going to get the internet, which is great, whether the government likes it or not. Uh, I think that's awesome. Um, and so I also think instead of need, not needing ground base, they're also going to innovate further and make these uh, receivers much smaller over time. You know, it might not be next year, the year after, but within five years, seven years, I think they'll be smaller and be on vehicles. You know, they'll be included with the Tesla vehicles, which I think is key. Um, and I don't think, I think he downplays that a lot right now. He doesn't want to upset their at t or other suppliers right now that give them chips for, <laughs> he doesn't want to step on their toes right now. He wants to keep good relations with all of them, obviously, as long as possible. But I think it's it's inevitable that Tesla is going to continue to own their own stack, and that includes the internet connectivity to the cars. And so I also think the real they go a step further later on in the decade, you know, when you have the real world AI applications, whether it's the humanoids or other things. Just think about military. You know, people talk. There's probably all kinds of incredible, like valuable military applications for the real world AI stuff Tesla's building. Not only that, the Starlink connections, the dependable Starlink connection that the military is going to demand, you know, uh, I think they're going to have to play a role. So basically everything real world AI um, application used is going to be superior if it has the standalone Starlink connection <clears throat> versus the ones that need a Wi-Fi or need a, you know, ground-based internet connection, which could go out from blackouts or whatever is going on on the earth. You know, like if you have that stable internet connection coming from beaming down from space all the time, you know, those real world AI application machines or robots or whatever are always going to be perceived as superior in versus the ones that don't have that capability. That's my view. And so Starlink owns that in my opinion, like I don't, and they're going to probably innovate and make the Starlink connections faster and more capable, you know, they're beaming tens of thousands of these satellites. Like they're not going to just like you, people go on Twitter like, oh, physics, they can't do more than that or whatever. But that's based on today's what's going on today. Like they're going to keep innovating the Starlink capability to be have more bandwidth, more capabilities, support more connections on the earth. I don't, that's my thoughts in a nutshell. Okay. What, what, what do you okay, think? Just really quick on the size of the antenna. I think there's a limit. I think there's a <laughs> physics limit on how small the antenna can be. And it has to do with the fact that the Starlink satellites are transmitting on a particular frequency it has a particular wavelength. I'm not claiming I understand the physics, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying. If I don't I, understand physics either. If I, I understand it correctly, because they're transmitting on this frequency, the, the size of the dish has to be larger than a certain size in order to be able to receive that wavelength. Again, not a physicist. I think yeah. I understand it like barely. In present um, day technology terms. Yes, that's right. No, no. Yeah. 
No, it's a physics thing. It's not an no, engineering physics thing. Based on present day technology. Yes, physics based on the present day technology. I'm saying the technology is going to be altered with a physics chain. You know, the physics capabilities will stay the same, but it'll apply to a different technology and they'll be able to have smaller antennas because of that. If they change the frequency that they use, then they could get to smaller antennas. But that would mean a whole new generation of satellites. Um, but let's get to the point about the valuation of Starlink. So, I mean, I have, I, I can go with my version of why I think Starlink becomes so valuable, but I'll, I, maybe I should ask you, you know, how does the fact that they have all this technology translate to a high valuation? What, where's the revenue? Where's the profit? Where do you see that? Yeah, well, just on the retail side, myself, I'm paying $100 a month for this connection. You know, they have 100,000 customers already. It's still sort of in beta mode. It's not even, and right. they, you know, it seems like they've sent out a ton of these Starlinks, like you said, but they can easily, based on SpaceX's capability, they can probably, within six months, send out a whole new generation of satellites that replace the current generation. You know, they're going to have to figure out space junk and all that stuff over time, the more they iterate and send new satellites out. But anyway, um, so $100 a month I'm paying, that's, you know, $1,200 a year times 100,000 customers. Let me my well, it's, back. it's easier if you yeah. say 1,000 a year instead of 100 a month. Okay. Yeah. A thousand a year times a hundred thousand. That's a uh, hundred million, hundred million a year or 120 million a year if it's 1200. So they're going to get to a million customers probably in a year or two. That'll be, you that's know, a billion. If you do a thousand a year, if they lower yeah. prices a little bit, then they'll ramp up to pretty quickly and go to 10 million a year or two after that, probably 10 exit again. Um, and so they'll get to 12 billion. I think they'll get to a hundred billion within a couple of years. You know, there's, billions of people on the earth that all want internet right. connections right and this is going to be the best of the best internet connections in my opinion and i think everyone's going to want it and it's just going to be like the default like instead of getting iphones you'll be like i use my starlink connection on my phone or um i know the antenna you say is an issue now but i think in the long run people will want starlink they'll, they'll have a way to make starlink available like in every everything even the phone well let me take that really quick I think the answer isn't putting a Starlink antenna on your phone. The answer is putting so many Starlink ground stations down, like, like the one you have, yeah. and hooking them up to cell towers. Yeah. You create micro cell towers with 6G. I'm making it up that there's a 6G. <laughs> yeah. Or, or y, you know, WiMAX or something. And so your phone connects to the Starlink ground station, which connects to the satellite, rather than your phone connecting directly to the satellite. And if you make, like, put, a, put this setup at every supercharger station. And then augment that with, they, you buy like the least expensive cellular company, the, the lowest market cap cellular company in whatever market you're in. You mm -hmm. use their antennas wherever they're available and you supplement them with antennas at every, at every super Tesla supercharger station and, and wherever else you want to put them. Wherever you find a weak spot, you just throw a Starlink up and a tower. Yeah. And you, and you a micro tower and you just handle like a, a five square mile radius or something. Yeah. That, that could go a long way. Okay. So- my numbers, I sort of close to the way you were analyzing it, but I would put it this way. I believe I started off with the theory that the market for Starlink was about 100 million, 100 million customers. I'm talking about residential. I'm leaving out the cruise ships and the military and everything else. You're saying globally or are you just saying in globally, North America? Globally. I started, I started, I, I changed my I, mind. Yeah. Good, good. I started out with 100 million, figured, all right, $1,000 a year. Okay, that's $100 billion a year in, in revenue. And the cost structure, which we should talk about, is really interesting. Well, mm -hmm. I'll do that now. So the cost structure, if they're launching satellites on Starship at 400 satellites a launch, and they get the cost of a Starship launch down to $2 million, right? Then four, $2 million divided by 400, I think, works out to $5,000 a satellite. So the mm -hmm. launch cost for the satellite becomes insanely cheap. And then... It effectively becomes zero because the cost of the satellite is so much more. So yeah, if you figure, yeah. if each satellite costs hundred thousand dollars, which I think might end up being high, you know, once they mass produce them and they figure it all out, they're going to get the cost of that down too. But call it hundred thousand dollars. If you have, there, I think the rough target for the the Starlink network, the larger Starlink network, was like forty four thousand satellites, and each satellite is good for about five years. So if you figure, let's say 50,000 satellites, you got to replace 10,000 satellites a year at $100,000 a piece. That works out to like 10,000 times 100 million. I think that works out to like 1 billion in costs for maintaining your fleet once, it up, once it's up. 
That's hmm. just a billion. You're making a hundred billion in revenue. Yeah. And that, you're paying one billion to keep your fleet. Figure you got like nine times as much of that in cost, and you're at ten billion dollars in cost. You've got ninety billion dollars in profit. The margin's yeah. insanely high. And here's what happened. I had this theory. I made this video, and the next day, the next day after I made this video, some I forget what publication came out with this number that they estimated the market for Starlink in the United States alone was sixty-five million customers. It's like, well, it's wait a minute. Way. If it's sixty-five million just in the U.S., yeah then the market's probably more like 300 million or 500 million. Even so bigger. my number, now I'm, I think you end up needing more than 50,000 satellites to support that volume of customer. Yeah. Right. So double the network and double the costs from, you know, 1 billion a year to 2 billion a year, plus your eight yeah. you know, billion, you just end up with this insane uh, valuation. So you, you end up with say $200 billion a year in profit, gross profit, you do some numbers, you end up with at a, you know, we'll go with a 30 price earnings ratio. You end up with something like $6 billion market cap. Yeah. Six trillion. Yeah. Yeah. Six, six trillion market cap, which again, that would be the largest, that would be three times the size of the largest company in the world today. Yeah. So, but what did you think of numbers like that when you came up with your numbers or did you have something yeah, very else in similar. mind? No, very similar to what you describe is the numbers I think of. And that's not even counting the military applications and other stuff that will be, maybe there'll be a special Starlink network just for that. That's, you know, super high premium, maybe needs the lower antenna connect, you know, who knows, but they're going to, this is just that base, based on present day technology that Starlink is doing that we know about. Think about in five years from now, how much more advanced it'll be. Right. And then you just got to imagine, like, we don't know that we don't know what we don't know, but you got to, you do know that it's going to get much better in five right. years. What I see is the next generation Starlink satellite after the current generation, like the, the generation they're about to launch has the laser links. Yes. Yeah. But I think the generation after that, number one, they increase the bandwidth that each satellite can handle and the number of connections that each satellite can handle and they decrease the cost. Right. So maybe the frequency soon, right? Maybe they change the frequency soon too. Maybe right? they're able to switch frequencies. I'm not sure. Again, that's a physics question that's beyond me, but I think you can Me see too. them. It's their natural path. They'll make it cheaper. They'll make it more capable. That's what Silicon Valley does with everything. So why wouldn't uh, Starlink do that? Okay. Yeah. So let's move on. I don't think there was necessarily more I wanted to talk. Is there anything else you wanted to say about Starlink before we move on? Yeah, I mean, I think what they'll do is they'll spin it out of uh, SpaceX as a publicly traded uh, stock, right? We've, ever, most people, they've just been commenting on that. Most people realize that hopefully in 2023, you know, would be great. But I think it, you know, if SpaceX was publicly traded today, what do you think the market cap would be? I mean, no, privately it's being bought and sold around like 80 billion or 90 billion most recently. But what do you think the market cap if it was publicly traded would be today? What are your, what's your guess? That's a me? really tough one because I think an IPO, would be high, but then once it was public, the 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 news media and the FUD would beat it down. And I I, I think fundamentally, let's talk about that for a second. So yeah. I think Starlink, I just laid out a path for Starlink's profitability, their, yeah. their revenue, their profitability. I think the picture for like the value of Mars is it's really hard to value Mars. It is. Like I think you know Starlink's primary mission is to get us to Mars. And yeah. I I until a few days ago, I was pretty confident of this, that Elon was not going, was going to keep the Mars part of SpaceX private. That was my theory. Now, That's, I, just, I think he's planning on that long term. Yeah, I think he is. Next but he just years. tweeted, like the other day, somebody tweeted something about this is why SpaceX has stayed private. And Elon just tweeted, eight years is a long time, like something's changed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but I, my theory was that the Mars mission is so important that he doesn't want to subject that to the whims of the stock market and having to do quarterly reports on here's how we're doing getting, making money going to Mars because they're not going to make money on Mars. I mean, here's how they make money on Mars potentially, right? They make money on Mars if they have a customer paying them to go to Mars. Yeah. And there's one customer I can think of who is reliably willing to pay lots of money to go to Mars. It's Elon. Yeah. Like Elon himself is the customer. Yeah, so yeah. if SpaceX went public and let's say they went public and Elon pocketed, because he owns more than half of SpaceX, I believe. Yeah, I think there's, he's a larger shareholder. I'm not sure what percentage. Is Last his. I remember, he owned more than 50% of SpaceX. Okay. Maybe the latest funding round changed that, but I doubt it. So they go public and maybe he cashes, he gets like, you know, a hundred billion dollars in cash out of that transaction. Yeah. Right. And now he can fund Mars. And let me tell you, um, 
here's my theory about Mars. Let's talk about Mars really quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to hear it. Their, their goal is to get to the point where they can deliver a human to the surface of Mars per person, humans to the purpose of surface of Mars per person for $200,000 a piece. Okay, that's, I think, a reasonable goal. I think when you look at everything about what they're trying to do to get launch costs down, that's a reasonable goal. Not, not the first, the first crew won't be $200,000 a piece, right? But when they're doing it in volume, they could get the cost down potentially to $200,000 a person. And that's round trip because the ships coming back will be relatively empty when you go, when you start going. And the goal is to land a million, to have a million person colony on Mars. Yep. So 200,000 times a million is $200 billion. You're with me so far. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Now figure you've got to supply, you've got to spend a lot more money getting them supplies. I think this is overly conservative as in the number is bigger than I think it needs to be. Let's say you spend another eight hundred billion dollars getting stuff there to support the two hundred uh, the million people at two hundred thousand dollars. So you're, you're paying four times as much to bring their stuff as you're paying to bring them. And keep yeah. in mind, with people you need life support. With cargo yeah. you don't need life support. So you yeah. can carry a lot more cargo uh, per dollar, kilograms of cargo per dollar than you can kilogram of human. Yeah. So and uh, basically you end up with a cost of a trillion dollars to establish a million person Mars colony. And I'm sure I'm getting something wrong. So I haven't included like people on Mars having yeah, children. Yeah, it's a massive amount of capital to- But call it a trillion. All right, so Elon owns Starlink, owns half of Starlink, which is worth 6 trillion. Yeah. So he's got 3 trillion there. Tesla, yeah. He owns 25% of Tesla selling for, that's worth $20 trillion. Yeah. Well, that's 5 trillion yeah. that he owns. His net worth is like over 10. We haven't even gotten to, I want to talk about Neuralink and Boring Company, and I've already yeah. got him over a $10 trillion net worth. Yeah. My point is that if, if Elon wants to pay for the Mars mission, he can write the check himself. Yeah. And I'm talking about by 2030, he will be a multi-trillionaire. And it's going to take a while to get the million person Mars colony going, but he's going to be able to write that. He's not going to need a government to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe he gets a government to go along and a government pays for it. Maybe Jeff Bezos stops suing him and decides yeah. to chip in, right? Yeah. I, mean, I could dream that something like amazing like that would happen. But it's yeah. almost like Jeff, if he has that much money, like Jeff Bezos is irrelevant, governments are irrelevant, Elon just spends yeah. it himself. Yeah. So it's almost like the way SpaceX goes public is if it recognizes that Elon is the customer. Yeah. Right? That Elon, you know, some sort of arm's length situation. So anyway, that's... that. So does the trillion dollar cost of a million person colony on Mars sound... It's probably a little optimistic, but does it sound crazy? I think more like... It's I, I I'm thinking it's gonna be much more than a trillion, but you know who knows? It's gonna be massive cost, but I think it's very practical or it's very foreseeable that Elon could foot most of that bill some way, some shape, some form with other companies, capital, or just tying the businesses together in such a way. I think what's interesting, like you said, there'll be a colony on Mars, like Elon's bringing. I think the way it goes down is you'll have all these Tesla humanoids kind of their building, you know, if you want to be a settler on Mars, yeah, you can pay 500,000 or whatever it costs. And basically SpaceX will show you the, they'll let you design your settlement on Mars in a way that the humanoid bots can start building it ahead of your departure. Oh, yeah. You can get like pictures ahead of time. Like, Hey, is this what looks like what you, what you like? And it'll be ready in one and a half years. And you can take that next uh, I think trip out there. I think the first cargo missions deliver solar panels and bots and the bots yes. set up the solar panels. I agree. The bots are going to be the key. And, uh, and, and energy storage to store the energy generated by the solar panels. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's the early missions, like launch bots to Mars, launch yeah. solar panels to Mars, unload the solar panels. The bots can take their time setting it up because the next ship is coming. A million bots on Mars before a million people. <laughs> It's very possible. Well, you know, if you could carry a hundred people on a starship to Mars, you could probably carry a thousand bots. Yeah, probably. Or more, because they don't need they don't need life support. But then let's get to this question of let's suppose you establish a colony on Mars, a growing colony on Mars, other than Elon paying for it. Is there a business case for it? Is this like the Dutch East India Company or the Dutch West, whatever those the is is there what's the business case? How does that make money for SpaceX other than Elon just giving him giving them money? I think there's gonna be a whole new economies on Mars that people want to get involved in. It'll be a brand new like ecosystem economy, you know, from terraforming Mars to new experiences to just being new on Mars to helping settlers get their settlements built by bots. 
you know, it'll just be thriving. Sort of like the last thing we saw was when, uh, I guess, our ancestors in Europe tried to settle, uh, you know, North America, and it was yeah. an economy of people coming over for new stuff, you know, it'll be like that, but in space, you know, and, and uh, it's going to be, it, it, I can't even imagine the economies that'll, the, the businesses right. that'll pop up, but there will be some crazy stuff. That is one of my theories about it is if you were, you wanted to get off earth, you, you wanted the adventure of going to Mars, and you said, you know what, I can see that economy growing, and I want to get in and out early. Yeah, right. I want to be the, the the head of the pizza chain on Mars, whatever, yeah. you know, I want to be the land developer on Mars. I have some yeah. image of what I could do in this Martian colony and I'll pay to get there early and be one of the early guys get not not setting the initial infrastructure, maybe. But once there's some basic infrastructure and I know I can live safely. Yeah, then I want to get out there and I want to start building this business on Mars. <clears throat> and as it becomes, a, and you know, we talk about a million person colony. I love your reference because I use the same reference to Europeans coming to the Americas. No offense to the Native Americans who got trampled over in the process. For as far as we know, we won't be trampling over any natives on Mars. Yeah. But, you know, we have, I don't know, is it like five or 600 million people in the Americas now? Yeah, uh, something right. like that. Three Nobody in 1492, yeah. you know, they didn't even know. Well, let's say, let's say 1520 or 1550 or something like that when they were starting to send more people over to, to the, the Americas. Nobody had any conception that there would be 600 million people there in a few hundred years. And that yeah. could very well happen on Mars, that it could become like a very large population. Yeah, that could be by 2050 or something. Yeah. Well, the million people might be by 2050, but then the path to 2150 to 2250, like, and if you got yeah. in early. So, all right. So th I think there's some potential there, but I, I struggle to figure out the economic model that makes it. That the, the launch industry, okay, I can see how SpaceX makes money on the yeah. launch industry. I don't know how big that grows. I think space tourism to the moon, like I don't think space tourism to Mars is that great because you're gone for like it's a long journey, 30 months. I think your trip is like 30 months. A trip to the moon could be a couple of weeks. Yeah. But I think so we can get the Mars thing down in that one cycle where it can be three months there, three months back, basically. I think they can, I think physically they can get that down maybe, but otherwise it's like 30 months. No, like said, no, it doesn't it. work. It doesn't work. It's not. Th it's three months there and three months back, but you got to spend eighteen months in the middle. Well, there's a six month window, is what I'm saying. So every eighteen months, there's or every. I, I don't think it works. Month window. I it, think it doesn't work. I I'll have to check on that, but I don't believe it works that you could get. And it, what? How are you going to take three month trip to spend a week there and then come back right away? Well, that's the thing. I guess it would be all about the journey, and maybe they get it down in two months, so they get there in two months, wow. and then you spend a month or two, and then you come back. You know, sort of like. A long uh, six. If months. you could get it down to a month, and you could spend a month on Mars and get back, maybe that's possible. But that's what that technology is a long way off. But you know, going to Mars, going to the Moon. But you're still talking about a three or four month trip. Yeah. Where the Moon, so. the Moon is like you know three day trip. You spend five days on on the Moon. You come back in three days. Maybe you can accelerate the travel time. The Moon could be a really good, you know, vacation, you know, vacation of a lifetime, and really not that expensive. All right. Yeah. So, so I see a lot of potential there, but. I have trouble figuring out what SpaceX is really worth, but let's move on. I want to ask you about Neuralink and the Boring Company because those are two Elon's two other companies that are up and coming. Yes. Have you thought much about the market potential for Neuralink and Boring Company? Yeah, I mean they're both huge. Uh, Neuralink, I can, I'm, you know, it's much easier to imagine the, you know, the fields they can go into you know, the, these neural laces or chips in our head, you know, oh, you read Ian Banks, right? Did you, <laughs> yeah. did you read the, no, I, didn't read Ian Banks. I know the stories. I didn't read the Ian Banks. I, I okay. you know, I, I don't, I'm not a huge reader. I need to read more. I'm just slow, but uh, if there's a movie about it, I'd watch it. Um, but I think that the chips in our brains is a reality in 10 years. Like almost everyone will have it in 10 years, just like the new iPhone and neural neural links sort of at the forefront of that. And uh it sounds strange right now, but there'll be some early people that get it to cure um, certain conditions they have, whether it's, you know, uh, people that have the um, well, it's paralysis uh, and blindness are the first ones. Yeah. Paralysis, blindness, uh, people that have epilepsy, you know, yeah. all kinds of brain conditions, pain, chronic pain. You know, that's going to be yeah. huge. That's going to be a big one. Alzheimer's. Yeah. yeah. And then those people start getting advantages that no one else has that like, I, I can read the internet in my mind. Everyone else is like, I want that too. So of course it's going to catch on. Yeah. It'll be mass adopted by 2030. And that company could be huge in itself. One of the biggest companies in the world for sure. Maybe the biggest, who knows, but 
I don't, you know, um, and then boring company. I still, oh, wait, I, let's, you know, let's, let's go with, with Neuralink before we get to boring company. Sure. So just, uh, for people who are interested in this, check my channel. And, uh, I did an interview, search my channel for Neuralink. And I did an interview or not an interview. I did a video about a presentation by Siobhan Zillis, S H I V O N Z I L I S. She's a project director or project. I forget the exact title at Neuralink. She did this lengthy presentation. I don't think mass adoption of Neuralink for healthy humans is coming in 10 years. Okay. I think the beginning of Neuralink for healthy humans is around 10 years away, according to Siobhan. Okay. That's not mass adoption. Mass adoption is probably five Five to 10 years later than that. But I'll just tell you my business model for Neuralink. Number one, you've got the people with brain disease. That's a big market. Anything that can be, you know, unhealthy problem that can be dealt with with by Neuralink. That's a big market, but the bigger market is what you said, mass adoption. Everyone has it. Well, the total addressable market then is 8 billion people by then. Yeah. Yeah. And $10,000 a piece. Now a large portion of the world can't afford $10,000, but they could take out a loan. Yeah. Or what if they start, what would be scary is what if, I don't think Neuralink would do it, but another company would do it if they're doing it, where they just give it to people for free in exchange for forcing you to listen to and be coded with advertisements in your head. <laughs> that sounds kind of like scary. a dystopian uh, yeah. TV series. Yeah. There's a TV series called Upload that sounds a little bit like that on uh, yeah. Amazon That's Prime. Scary. But if it's the only way to get it for free, you can imagine some company trying to put that out there. But I think it's more like you could finance it and you could pay it off by working and, yeah. and you become highly productive once you have Neuralink in your, in your brain. But mm-hmm. stepping aside from the 8 billion number, I was just saying, let's suppose the market is 100 million people that can afford it, okay? And, he, and 100 million people a year buy it. Like scaling up to produce that many and install that many is gonna take a while. But let's suppose you get to a point where you're installing 100 million a year, which is yeah. 80 years to do 8 billion people, right? So you got plenty of time. Yeah. And let's say it's $10,000 a piece. Well, 100 million times $10,000. That's a lot. Yeah. Well, that's a billion dollars a year. Yeah. And it's pretty probably mostly profit. And so that, you know, that ends up being a big market cap. And then every three Wait, years- a trillion dollars a year, isn't that? A hundred million times 10,000? Isn't that a trillion yeah. dollars a year? Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. It's a trillion dollars a year in revenue. Figure it's $50 billion a year in profit, but but wait, there's more. Yeah. Every three or four years, like the iPhone, there's an upgrade. Yeah. Right? Software updates too, you could buy maybe. Neural, yeah. Neuralink 10XR, right? Yeah. The Neuralink uh, version you know, 14 or whatever. And so- the, the potential market potential for that is absolutely insane. And then you can download modules, right? I want to learn Kung Fu. Yeah. Right, right out of the matrix. The you matrix. can learn Kung yeah. Fu. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? There's so much potential for that. It's really hard to grasp. So I think that becomes a really large company. Now let's talk about boring company. What do you think about boring company? Boring company. I'm excited about, um, in, in, but it's, it's more boring. <laughs> it's like, it's like you're building tunnels, you know, like, yeah, but they got to really, ramp this thing like building tunnels is i think they're trying to get it to be like one tenth as fast as a human walks or something like the the rate of being able to build it or one I think it's even slower than that yeah, so, yeah. so beat the snail the rate, but they're trying to build up to that that's their aspirational something like that but that's slow but they could deploy you know hundreds of these all over the, the problem i see with the boring company is all the regulatory jurisdiction legal crap they got to deal with to get approvals and different you know cities countries counties that's the hassle I see. I mean, you'll see some countries like get on, jump on the bandwagon and be like, build us these tunnels for our major cities. We'd love it. But then it's just going to, that, that's the red tape I'm unsure of that could take, that could really right. make it uh, suffocate a little bit. But so what, I'll, what I'll you- give you my take on where Boring Company I think is going. Okay. So you look at Las Vegas right now, they have a rough plan of what they're going to do. And Las Vegas, there's about a thousand cities in the world that are in the same ballpark population as Las Vegas, just to okay. start with that. As I look at the Las Vegas plan, I think it's 30 or 35 miles now is the current plan, but ultimately I could see that expanding to hundred miles of tunnel just you know, in the city. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and if there's a thousand cities like that, then you know, hundred miles times a thousand is a hundred thousand miles. Right, right now they have like a couple of miles of tunnel. Yeah. And uh-huh. they're gonna go to hundred thousand miles of tunnel and that's just in the cities. Now, what if they decide to do tunnels from city to city? Well, now you got a whole other network of tunnels. And then my, I don't know if you've heard my big idea about the Bering Strait. No, I haven't. So I call it boring Bering. Okay. Um, 
this and I, and I I thought I made this up, but it turns out people have been talking about this for over a hundred years. That okay. either tunneling or doing a bridge over the Bering Strait is an idea that that the Chinese have talked about, the Russians have talked about. So you do basically you run a tunnel. Actually, my vision is you run four tunnels up the west coast of the U.S. through Alaska, through the Bering Strait, down through Russia, down into China. Probably have a spur going over to Europe around the Arctic Circle. Hmm. Um, potentially goes down into Southeast Asia, but you you basically can connect the Europe, the Eurasian supercontinent with the Americas. Yeah. Um, you know, and even Africa is probably accessible by this. So you, you're basically covering almost the entire world. Australia is a little tougher because the, the length of distance you'd have to go underwater to get to Australia would be tough. Yeah. Um, Antarctica is probably not worth worrying about, but you know, that's probably not viable. But yeah. the, the five major populated continents of the of the planet are accessible all in one link. And now two tunnels are Hyperloop and two tunnels are cargo mm. shipping containers. Yeah, yeah. So now you've basically replaced. And then when you add tunnels all over the continents that are you know not doing that, you've basically replaced the need for all commercial air travel and most ground travel with boring tunnels. And... To me, that if the boring company now is probably worth two or three billion dollars, or maybe five billion dollars, but if they're yeah. going to fifty thousand x on the cities alone, and then add something like the Bering Strait, the whole that whole big idea, it's like a hundred. Like if I could buy, I tried to buy stock in the boring company. I'm trying to figure out how I could buy stock in the boring company. Yeah, I think that's a hundred thousand x potential. You know, like that could be the luck. That could basically take over all, like you, you mentioned EV tall. Like yeah. if you have hyperloops going everywhere at a thousand miles an hour at low cost per passenger. Yeah. Why would anybody ride an EV other than billion, than a billionaire's toy? Why would anybody want an EV tall? Yeah. So, I'm, so first of all, there's that idea of an, and I agree with you that there will be um, some cities or counties or countries or whatever will be slow to adopt boring, but this is why I think they're doing Las Vegas. And I think they will do Orlando at some point and why they're going to do Miami. You do it at tourist destinations. You do it places that have convention centers mm -hmm. where the government bureaucrats from all these other cities come in for a convention and they experience it. And they're not going to bring it to their cities because they care about the people in their cities because they don't. Yeah. They're going to bring it to their cities because they want it for yeah. themselves. This is going to solve my commute. There was actually at a Steve Davis CEO of Boring Company was presenting at some Las Vegas or Clark County commission meeting. And one of the guys was like, one of the commissioners, like the yeah. government officials was like, yeah. you know, this is going to reduce my commute from 30 minutes to seven minutes. And like I've done, the, I was on a town board. I, I've seen presentations to local, you know, the board members are asking all these tough questions. You know, well, what about this problem? What about this problem? Mm -hmm. And this guy was like, well, when can you start? <laughs> right i want this as soon as possible because yeah. it's going to reduce my like all that stuff about caring about the environment caring about the other impacts like if it's going to reduce my commute from 30 minutes to seven minutes i want yeah, this I now mm -hmm. and imagine you're like cleveland and the boring company comes and they make a proposal and you say no and yeah. then cincinnati says yes yeah. and two years later everyone in cincinnati is zipping around and the traffic jams are gone and you yeah. go from Cleveland to Cincinnati. You didn't want to, but you had to because there was a Bengals game or something. And you yeah. get there and they're like, holy crap, where's all the traffic? And yeah. you figure it out and you, and you find out that your mayor yeah. stopped this from happening. That guy's out. He's done. There's yeah. another guy who's running for office saying, hey, we're going to get boring company here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I think that solves that problem that if you if you have once you have it successful somewhere, especially a place like Vegas or Orlando, which has a lot, which have a lot of tourists or Los Angeles, which has a lot of tourists, or had, as long as we resume tourism at some point in the world, then I think you start to see like everyone wants it. Yeah. And then I loved you what you said about building multiple machines. Mm -hmm. One boring machine isn't going to do it. You've yeah. got to have a thousand boring machines. Yeah. And so you need the machine that builds the boring the machine that builds yeah. the boring machine. A factory, a boring factory machine. Yeah. And that's probably going to be in Austin, Texas, is my theory. They're going to build the boring machines. And there'd probably be, you know, one on each continent or something like that. You know, one factor in each continent. Okay. So that covers that. 
So I, I like I, your vision there. I, I agree that I think it's very uh, possible the vision you put forth there. I just think it, I also think it'll take longer to play out. You know, we were talking on 2030 as a time frame, but neural only 2035 is 40. I think the boring company could play out the way you're saying, but in the, but by the 2030s is when it matures right. to kind of that kind of. Growth so the thing. really big difference between the boring company and everything else we've talked about is the technology for the boring company is much easier. Yeah. Right. Neuralink yes. is like, we have no idea if this is going to work, how well this is going to work with the brain. Yeah. Starlink, we're pretty sure is going to work, but you know, like the whole Mars mission. Yeah. Yeah. That may or may not, that may not work as well as we hope. Like I have simple questions like, will humans be able to reproduce in low gravity? I don't know. Yeah. How if will you, our hearts uh, be long-term in that kind of weird low gravity? Will they? Have I have problems? a whole theory about that, which involves the boring company, by the way, that you fly a boring company, to, a tunnel boring machine to Mars and you make a big circle underground. Yeah. And you put a, a train in, and my vision is the train runs 24 hours a day with a break every eight hours. And mm -hmm. basically you spend 16 hours a day in the tunnel and it's going around at a speed to simulate 1G. Oh, wow, interesting. And you spend eight hours on the Martian service, you spend most of your time, and maybe you're like an Iron Man, you spend two, two shifts on the Martian service, or maybe you only need to be in it once a week, I don't know. But if yeah. you create that, and like, if you get pregnant, yeah. You go in the tunnel. Yeah. If you're trying to get pregnant, you stay in the tunnel. Which... You should be a sci-fi writer, Warren. You should. You have a lot of good ideas. I think uh, you'd be a good science fiction author. I, I made a video about the the loops on Mars. I made a video yeah. about that. I I don't I don't have the I have like too many novels to write, and I, I write five <laughs> chapters of any novel, and then I stop. Then I like get bored and move on to something else. I'd read it. I'd read it. I seriously, I've I've written like the first few chapters of like five novels now. Okay. Finishing right. them is the hard part. <laughs> So, all right, let's move on. You had a tweet um, today or yesterday. It was like an eight tweet thread called, you okay. called it the runaway market rally. What, yeah. what was that about? Uh, just that I think we're in a different era. Um, and this decade is going to be very, in terms of innovation and technology with AI and automation that the market and, and and most importantly interest rates i think are going to remain indefinitely super low and market participants haven't really put that together they always think the past is like the future or the future is going to be like the past and you know they don't they're not anticipating the accelerated change going on um in the in in business in general and uh when they put all of that together, you know, th th then I had a lot of Bitcoin, you know, hyper bulls respond to my thread being like, yeah, this is already happening with inflation. I'm like, it's not just inflation. Like this is more about also, you know, technology accelerating faster than we've ever seen before combined with the low interest rates and possible inflation. But I think the market's going to have this phenomena where like, instead of like these 10% or 20% corrections down every couple of years that we've been used to, and everyone sort of expects, like right now we're kind of flirting at all time highs. I think a lot of investors are just kind of expecting like, yeah, sooner or later, the market's going to dip 10%, then I'll buy, you know, and there's tons of like old school investors, like just on the sidelines waiting. I can see it's kind of just like melting up slowly. And then a sudden like jump up 10%, of uh, the whole market, you know, like maybe the growth tech stocks are going up 10 or 20% and maybe the value stocks that aren't really tech related only go up 5% or something. But I think that that sudden jump could be, you know, a couple of days or it could be a week or two or in the future, later in the decade, might see some of those sudden jumps that are like a flash crash reverse, you know, like upwards. And uh, I just think it's going to be a new phenomenon that could happen. I'm not saying it's like definitely going to happen. I'm just saying like, be on the lookout. Like me personally, I'm on the lookout for this. Like I'm not, you know, the market does what we don't expect. And that's something I think most people don't expect. And to me, it suits the environment we're in as something that could happen. Wait, wait, um, well, yeah. the market does what we don't expect. That sounded really deep. I don't know if you, if you realize how deep that sounds. Like <laughs> we all expect yeah. the market to behave this way. Yeah. And there, there's some really... Like, you just kind of hit me hard with what you just said, but I wanted to ask you about that. So I am very concerned about the inflationary policy of the US Federal Reserve and other countries printing money like we've never seen before. And if anybody doesn't believe me, Google M1, M as in Mark 1, Fred, F-R-E-D, mm -hmm. which is the Federal Reserve uh, tracking the money supply. I think the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis or something like tracking the money supply. And you will see that we are printing money like 
incredibly fast compared to anything in the past. So to me, that's obviously inflationary and the markets are not, to my mind, figuring out. I think that's a very, very risky thing. The other side of it, as you mentioned, the technology and Kathy Wood talks about the rapid acceleration of technology being deflationary. Yes. So those two things may be running against each other. I yeah. think if we weren't printing money as recklessly as we are, then the advance of technology could compensate for the printing of money, but we're printing it so fast, it's absolutely insane. Do you have any thoughts, first of all? I mean, I think what you were saying is kind of what Kathy Wood's been saying about technology being deflationary. Yes, yes. But we also see like housing is not deflating right now. No. Housing is inflating rapidly. Um, yeah. Asset prices, are, there's this thing where we're seeing asset price inflation that some feel is being driven by uh, inflate by printing money and others feel it's being driven by, like, I don't think Tesla's stock is, if Tesla's stock was going up based on money printing, then the stock would be a lot higher than it is now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I, I think that there are some tech companies and I, I struggle to figure out which ones there are some tech companies that are going to go up more than others. So why does it become a runaway market rally? Well, I just call it that, like, sort of like what no one expects, like we're at all time highs. People aren't expecting the stock to suddenly go up 10 more percent from an all time high. We're already at, you know, like maybe they expect a 10 percent. Like if we overcorrect down 20 percent, maybe coming back 10 percent, people are like, oh, I've seen that before that happened. But no one's really expected like us to be at all time highs like we are now. And then suddenly, you know, the S&P goes up 8 percent. Nasdaq goes up 15 percent. And Dow Jones goes up 5% in like a matter of a week or two, you know, like I think we're on the cusp of, of, of something like that happening. And I think it's going to catch so many people off guard because what's, it's sort of like going to be like a phenomena that is generated by these mass markets of market participants where, you know, so much cash is on the sidelines building up, waiting for this crash. And then suddenly it's like, all right, we're up one or 2% today and up about 3% the next day. And some of people are like, I just got to get in, like FOMO is going to creep in. It's just going to, there's not enough sellers and it's just going to create like a quick rise and it'll kind of stabilize up there again and kind of like hover for a while, maybe keep going up slowly at that point. But right. I just think it's kind of, it's a new, and it's because of inflation and the innovative technologies coming out, accelerating uh, revenues of companies and low interest rates all combined. You know, it's, it's just, it just to me seems like it's a new era we could be entering this decade you know, okay. I, I probably we're going to crash 20% in the next week after I kind of put that out there. <laughs> like, Emma, you've been wrong, you know, but, you know, I, I've been thinking about it a long time. It just feels like this is the decade that this type of thing is going to happen, whether it's this year, next year, the year after. I think there's going to be some weird weirdness to the market soon. Yeah. Like that. I don't I don't tend to worry about making short term stock price predictions because I think it's impossible to do. Yeah, um, I agree. I, I But let me ask you about the, the inflationary side, the, the money printing side. Do you see that as a borderline existential risk to global economic, the global economy. I, I, let me say that. Let me say it differently. I see the, this incredible pace of money printing as being an existential threat to the entire global economy. Do you yeah. think I'm going too far with that? Uh, I mean, I think it's always been there in society and economies of history, kind of this inflation stuff. And it's always kind of been fear mongered. And it's maybe more so in the last year than it has been in previous years. Um, and maybe it'll increase, you know, modern monetary theory has been pretty aggressive lately, that whole way, like getting off the gold standard. Bitcoin helps keep it in check a little bit over time, I think. But and gold, obviously, but uh, Bitcoin is going to become a bigger role, hopefully, to keep this more in check with governments. But it's basically another way for governments to tax their people without their knowing, basically, is just to print more money. Um, so I do see it as a risk, but it's always been a risk in our history of societies, in my opinion. Um, and the government's there for good reason. We don't live in an anarchist society, unfortunately, where everyone can just roam freely and roads are magically there. You know, like governments need money and they're inefficient, you know, by their nature. It's a system. There's no like person that's a bad actor. It's just the system is there. It's so big. It's the, I think Elon says the corporation to the limit or something. And it's true. It's just you can't fight it. You just got to work with it the best you can and try to improve it. And um, it serves good purposes in many ways too, but it's, it's ugly and, and uh, disgusting in other ways. Yeah. I can't be that kind. <laughs> Emmett, it's ugly and disgusting. Oh, I can't be that kind. Um, 
So yeah. when you talk about the runaway market rally, I have a loosely related idea about Tesla specifically. Yep. And this comes from, if you go back in the past, you would have something like Cisco Systems became mm -hmm. sort of like the darling of Wall Street, that it became the market leader for internet hardware. And it got a valuation much higher than its competitors, you know, based on, let's say, price earnings ratios. And I ended up buying stock in like F5 Networks and Foundry Networks, which were competitors to, uh, to um, Cisco. And they went up a lot because their, their price earnings ratios were lower relative mm -hmm. to, and I actually looked really carefully at like dilution, like how many options did they have out there? That was one of the things I really looked at when I was buying those stocks. And I made a lot of money on those. Well, I didn't have a lot invested at the point, but I, you know, my, those investments did really well. So, but the point is that there's this sometimes tendency of the, of Wall Street to adopt a particular company, whether it's Microsoft or Intel, this is the big player in the market. If General Electric, this is the number one player in the market. And it ends up getting a price premium because of a perception that this is the big player. Yeah. Which may or may not be justified. And I feel like if Tesla gets to 5 million vehicles a year and growing fast, if it gets to 10 million vehicles a year and it becomes the number one auto producer, at some point, Wall Street caves on the FUD anti-Tesla theory and it switches to the, oh, they're the big player now, we adopt them. And so when yeah. I say it goes to $20,000 a share based on fundamentals, Wall Street overshoots. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think that there's going to be a fast run up in Tesla at some point again. I just don't know if it'll be next year or in 2025, 2026. At some point, there will be a overshooting, like you're saying, where institutional right. Wall Street kind of anoints Tesla as the future of all transportation. Right. It becomes, know. let's say it becomes the largest company in the world, right? Yeah. Which you're predicting that as well. Yeah. I, I'm predicting it much more aggressively than you are. But even if it just becomes the most valuable company in the world and reaches what, what you and I would say should be a $5 trillion valuation based on fundamentals, Wall Street yeah. pushes it to 10 because it's the big player. And I think that it will be the biggest company like 50, 50 by 2025. Like I'm not saying it's not going to happen, but I think it's like 95, 98% sure in my mind by 2030. But okay. yeah, I mean, yeah. All right. A couple of small things. You tweeted that you got a plaid model S and you have the yoke steering wheel. So can you give your rough yeah. impressions about what it's like to own a plaid, what it's like to drive a plaid and what it's like to drive the yoke? Yeah, I love the, the, the yoke is, is a, seems like people like to pick on the negatives the most, you know, the plaid is like the perfect car does everything outstanding. And everyone's like, oh, that yoke, you know, like I can't get used to like Edmonds had a thing about it recently. And um, I made you know, a video about thing, that. <laughs> the first, the first night I took delivery, I was like, oh, yoke's cool, but I'm not sure about it, you know, and after a day or two of driving, it got more comfortable and my the ergonomics of me turning the wheel became very smooth in a week. And I felt like, wow, this is way cooler when I got to do a long turn. I, my hands just figured it out. I didn't have to like take any training course or no one had to teach me. You just intuitively, your, your arm- Your machine learning figured it out. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And the, the, you know, it just becomes easier to manipulate and more comfortable. Number two, it like forces me to keep my hands at three and nine on the steering wheel. Like not, that, you know, I didn't know that's the safest place personally to have your, your hands on the steering wheel, but apparently that's the safest place to have your hands on the steering wheel. So of course, whenever I'm going to drive fast, I'm going to keep both hands and I'm going to be forced like, you know, without knowing it, I'm automatically putting them at the safest place you can have in the past, maybe my model S. I might put them up top or one on top, one on bottom, or who knows what I would do. I don't know. But now I'm like, and then the third thing is like, you have this, you know, uh, you can see your whole dashboard now. No problem. There's nothing obstructing it. So much better. Like you have more visibility, more real estate to look at for screens and instruction directions or whatever. And so I thought those things were amazing. The, uh, the, the, the last thing I would say is that um, the one thing I haven't fully adjusted to is the honk button. You know, you guys a button for the honking the horn. You know, I wish you could still, you know, because I don't practice it enough. I'm not honking at people all day. It's like once in a while I want to honk and I have to like think about, oh, how do I honk on this? Oh, and then I, it's too late by then sometimes. Um, and then this, the, the blinkers, you know, the touch sensor blinkers, I'm comfortable with them. Uh, but maybe there, there was a better way they could have done it. I don't know, but it's, 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 you know, it, I'm comfortable with it. I'm not saying it, those are the tiny, tiny, tiny things, but right. you know, everything else about the car is so amazing. Like, I love it. Like the, the, the big screen is even bigger in the middle of the car. 
um, and uh, the acceleration is fast. You know, there's a little screen in the back. My kids can watch, you know, cartoons when we're going on a road trip. Um, you know, the, the sound is amazing. You got the air cooled seats in the front for hot days. It's great, you know, and every way, shape, I use the acceleration from time to time as a novelty with new people in the car, just my kids. Sometimes they want to drive fast. So if I'm getting on the highway, I'm like, kids, we're going to go. And they love it. It's like a roller coaster for them. Um, you know, I think the best value is the, the new Model S without the plaid, like, you know, without the extra $40,000 for the speed, you know, that's the better value. And, and you get better range too. Better range. Yeah. But I, I, as an early, as a big investor, I am in Tesla. I always want the first thing they have as soon as possible. And so I put a deposit down early and I wanted to take delivery as soon as possible, just to reconfirm in my head with my own hands-on research that, you know, Tesla is making the best technology, you know, what would you say, I don't know what other cars you've driven. Would you say the Plaid Model S is the best car you've ever driven? For sure. I mean, I haven't driven every car out there. I've driven some, you know, Mercedes, high-end Mercedes, BMWs, you know, they're smooth. You know, the smoothness of some of those cars are hard to beat, but the Plaid, other than like, you know, it's still smooth. I'm not saying it's not, but everything else about the Plaid is like superior, you know, the driving experience, um, never having to stop at a gas station, the technology, the self-driving that's coming onto it, you know, everything is so superior. It's like, you know, you, you can't, win everything a hundred percent, you know, but overall it's by far the best car I've ever driven. Um, another little thing. And I don't know if you know, I've ordered a plaid model X, which for me oh, is nice. probably really stupid. <laughs> financial fitness, I love, most of my Tesla, all of my Tesla stock is in an IRA. Okay. And, and I'm not touching that. So yeah. although I have a lot of Tesla stock, I can't really touch it. Yeah. Um, I, I can't take money out of my, I mean, theoretically, I suppose I could take money out of my IRA, but I'm not going to, I don't want to sell any of my Tesla stock. I don't want to do margin. So the, I have this theory, I have a cyber truck, actually I have two cyber trucks in order, but I have one of the early cyber truck orders. So the, my theory is that I'm going to buy, if I, first I'm buying a model three, like next week from Omar Kazi okay. driving yeah, it back here. That. But, that's exciting. Yeah. You're going to get but, that. That's your first Tesla, right? That'll be my first, I'm not the first one I've driven, but the first one I own. Yeah. So I'm getting my house wired for charging and everything already working on that. So. Well, I can't even imagine a more enthusiastic Warren Redlick on Tesla. And that's going to happen once you own it. I, think. I actually more enthusiastic. No, so here's what's funny. Let me say this. So I actually think once you have a Tesla, you get spoiled and you might forget why you hated having a gas car. So let me say this. I'm actually more enthusiastic about Tesla because every time I go to a gas station with my car, I feel like an idiot. <laughs> and I just got an oil change. I had, oh, an, oil, there and you're I had an, I had an oil leak. I have drips of oil on my garage floor and I had to go to a, a place and get the oil changed. And oh. it turned out, you know, maybe it was like some little thing was bent. It wasn't like a big problem, yeah. yeah. but you know, they just did a regular oil change and it fixed the drip. But like, I, I'm going to guess you've never had an oil leak on your Tesla. <laughs> Not it's never yeah. it's never stained the floor of your garage yeah. you never have to sit for three hours at a dealership waiting for it to get the oil change done you know so anytime i have to do something with my gasoline powered car i yeah. feel like a total idiot that's actually more compelling than owning a tesla because i've <laughs> driven them a few and i understand the yeah. benefits and i know like you, you know, know, I, know what you're missing yeah right you know and i just did like a seven hour drive of my friend's model y drove up to visit my mom at her assisted living facility and on the way and came back and I probably about six hours of it on navigate on autopilot. Oh, and I had awesome. to charge a bit. The charging was a challenge. That's a little bit annoying because the Sebring, Florida does not have a supercharge. I believe it's coming, but they oh did not God. have, and that's, it's like in the middle of the state. It's, um, yeah. it's awkward. The nearest supercharger is at least 50 miles away, maybe 70 miles away. So, mm. But I went to the supercharger stations and oh, it's such a pain having to wait so long. No, it's at a Wawa. I go in and I get like a snack or I get a coffee or something and like yeah. and I and I check my text messages or something. Yeah. You know, it's like a short break. It's not a big deal. And a lot of times you stop at a supercharger and you only stop for like 10 minutes. Yeah. It's absolutely. not necessarily that bad. So that that was nice to learn that a little bit. Um, and maybe there's more I'll appreciate once I have one. But you know, it's just there was a, a bunch of things that came together on getting this. But so in April. I'm probably not going to go through with it, but supposedly my Plaid X will be ready for delivery in April. Wow. It was like a hundred dollar non-refundable deposit. Like, all right, I'll take an option on that. And the theory is I buy the Plaid X in April. Cybertruck comes end of the year, let's say early yeah. 2023 or something like that. So I've had the Plaid X for six or eight months. 
and I turn around and sell it when I buy the Cybertruck, right? Yeah. Well, the thing that really motivated me to buy that, there, there was, I think it was Sawyer Merritt tweeted that they had raised the price of the long range S and the long range X again. Oh so, yeah, that's right. So you got in before that. Bryce. No, 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 no. They didn't raise the price of Plaid. That's the okay. point. Okay. So the long range S is now 90. The long range X is now 100. The Plaid S is like 130. Yeah, it's it's going up. Or the Plaid X is only 120. Yeah, it's less, like, right? Yeah, they haven't good. raised the price of. They've been raising the price of everything else, but X long range is 10,000 more than S long range. But S Plaid is 10,000 more. Like it should be the opposite. Plaid X should be 10,000 more than Plaid S. You'd think so, yeah. So was- I had this like arbitrage idea in my head that. I am buying a literal hypercar, right? Yeah. 2.5 seconds, zero to 60 is pretty competitive with Ferrari. Yeah. yeah. Right. Most Ferraris are struck, you know, the quarter mile is probably going to be better than a lot of cars. Cause you've seen, I don't know how, I don't know if you've been on a drag strip with it yet. I have. Yeah. I don't know. I went on a drag strip with my model S like in the first week or two had some viral, uh, tweets and videos about it and uh yeah it was cool yeah but the the fact that it continues accelerating hard the whole way yeah. is something that is really hard to wrap your head around so yeah like i actually am not like somebody who gets into hyper i was when i was younger but at this stage of my life i'm 55 i just kind of like got to be grumpy old man and i'm <laughs> not that i never drive fast but it doesn't excite me the way it did when i was younger yeah and it's more like i think the x is a lot more practical than the s it is and yeah, my you wife know, has an X, a normal X. It's it's good, yeah. Yeah. So, but I just think that I buy it at 100. When you add everything up, it's because I bought FSD and I got a couple options. It's like 140. But by the time I get the Cybertruck, let's say the end of the year, I think it. I just saw somebody was selling a Plaid for like 175 thousand dollars. Like yeah. I think people might pay thirty thousand or forty thousand more than what I paid for it, especially if they figure out, hey, this is worth more than an S. Yeah. So I maybe, think they might only limit the production of the plaid. Like I can't imagine them selling hundreds, a hundred thousand of these plaids with this ridiculous zero to sixty acceleration right. in the hands of the wrong people. The horrific accidents that could happen. You know, I just don't think I, the demand is that high. There's not enough people to yeah. buy them. Yeah. So, so there will be a fairly limited supply of them, and maybe, maybe I'm right. I buy it, and at the end of the year, Cybertruck comes, and I sell the plaid X. And I get my Cybertruck and then I'm happy because that's the vehicle I really want. And along the way, I give my Model 3 to my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> Omar's, Omar and Elon's Model 3. So, <laughs> all right. So let me move on. What was the guy's name? There was, I'm moving on to a slightly different topic and this should be short. Koguan Leo, yes. some big Chinese investor announced he's buying a million shares of Tesla stock. Do I have that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he, uh, he. I guess he already owns a million shares, or and he's saying he's buying another million shares. Uh, right. So that's seven hundred fifty million dollar investment in Tesla. Huge, huge. Like I don't think the markets. You know, I don't think people pick this. Like news stories haven't picked this up. I don't know. I mean, it seems like it's a pretty verifiable Twitter account. I've talked to a few people that said, "No, this is the real guy. It's not some fake parody account. And he's legit, multi billionaire." You know. Did he so, say he's already bought five hundred thousand of that? 500,000 yeah. shares first couple of days of this week, I guess he bought 500,000 and the next couple of weeks, he says by the next 500,000. So when the market was sort of down, all the growth stocks were down the other day and Tesla kind of remained flat and went up even a couple of a dollar or two, that might've been a big part because he's met buying a few hundred. Okay. Well, the average trading volume of Tesla, I'll tell you right now is um, 20 million shares a day. Okay. And of that 20 million shares traded, I would estimate that only like a few million shares of that is actually net buyers or net sellers. You know, the rest of it is like high frequency arbitrage, just trading with each other for a penny or two or whatever, you know, and algos right. trying to do stuff. So when you're buying 500,000 shares in a day, net buyers, that's a big imbalance to the number of sellers most likely, and it's going to bring the price right. up, you know, so that's my opinion. Um, so when he buys the next 500,000, it'll be another supporter could drive the price up 10 or 20 bucks. And then if you get enough people kind of catching wind of this and follow on people buying, it could continue more momentum. Like when Larry Ellison announced that he was buying, you know, X million shares of Tesla several years ago, the price of Tesla stock went up like 10% on a day and then it went up another five or 10% the next couple of days well, or something. Well, you brought up something I wasn't planning to talk about, but it's something that I find striking. I often say to people, I don't predict short ter- short-term stock prices because short-term stock prices are driven by those arbitrage traders. They're driven by short-term traders. 
They're not mm -hmm. long-term investors do not play a significant influence on daily stock price. Long-term investors play a significant influence on stock price movements over long term. Mm -hmm. So if the short-term traders drive the value of Tesla down enough, then people like me, I, I literally like searched my bank, my stock, my my brokerage accounts to mm -hmm. figure out can I scare up enough money to buy a few more shares when it dipped down below 600. Yeah. You know, there's there, and I think there are other, you know, I'm like talking to my wife, can we take out a home equity loan on the house? No. All right. <laughs> but like, you know, I, I'm pretty much, I want to, I, I can't be all in on Tesla, but you know, there's this tendency to just go all in. If you're all in, you can't scrape up, scrape up more money, but yeah. other long-term investors at some point are persuaded, wait a minute. I just looked at their numbers. I just looked at their fundamentals. This company's badly undervalued. I'm going to jump in now. And yeah. I think that that's, that's a long-term driver of share price, but it doesn't affect the short-term price. And I, I just find that's why I don't predict short-term share price because I can't know what the algorithms and high-frequency traders are doing. Yeah. All the day traders, like I, I just can't, that's, that's too complicated. I don't think anyone can fully understand how, the, how that works. No, it's, it's, I mean, I worked in the electronic brokerage industry for years and uh, I feel like I have, you know, some level of insight to a little bit how the electronic trading works, but it's complex and complicated and uh, there's high frequency trading that's like all intraday or intra minute trades. And then there's like speculative traders that are short term that hold positions for days or weeks at a time. And then there's, you know, longer term traders, obviously. Yeah. So it all combines. But some one thing I hear people say is like, yeah, there's so many more sellers today. And that's why the test. One thing I think people get mistaken on is that there's more sellers than buyers. That are, there's always the same number of sellers as buyers, right? It just depends on what the price is at. And that's what creates the price. Yeah. Right. Okay. So the last thing I wanted to ask you about was for you to tell my audience what good soil investment management is, what you created. Is it a fund? Is it a, what, what is it? And tell people what's your, what's your investing philosophy for it? What's that all about? Sure. So for the last, uh, 13 years, I worked with interactive brokers until about a year ago, I uh, made enough money for myself where I realized, you know, even though I loved my job in prime brokerage sales, I was like the number one producer there for a while in the US and reported to the founder, Thomas Petterfee, incredible guy, if you don't know who he is, fun to listen to some him talk, He's sort of a visionary in fintech that Elon is in, in uh, but in fintech sort of with interactive brokers. Um, but I loved working there, working with him. And I just felt like I had to retire and do work for myself once you get to a certain level, because I'd been trading for myself. And it was very, 2020 was a very big year for me. Um, and I, my income, my net worth level jumped a couple levels up, not just one level where I was always envisioning starting my own hedge fund, because uh, that's who I serviced when I was in prime brokerage sales, is I helped small hedge fund managers get started, whether it's a Goldman Sachs executive leaving to start his own hedge fund or portfolio manager, leaving a bigger fund, start his own five or $10 million hedge fund with some investors or whatever. So that was my next step I had always envisioned, but my net worth jumped up more than enough to like, so I had, I used to want to start that hedge fund to make more money for myself, but my net worth had jumped in 2020 to a level where it was like, well, I don't really need to make more money for myself. Maybe I should start a restaurant or do something else. And I really had to like, and keep in mind, this is during like the COVID crash crisis, you know, <laughs> like you don't know if people are going to die from this COVID thing at the time. Like there's so much uncertainty. It felt like the world was ending. All the kids are at home. It's just like everyone's supposed to stay in their houses and you can't go out to anywhere. It was just kind of a weird time. And anyway, I uh, really uh, thought about it and prayed about it and such and realized, you know, maybe if I do have some unique God-given ability to spot investment opportunities other people don't. Maybe I could do something good with it other than just further my own wealth with it, you know? So I said, okay, I know how to make a hedge fund, how to set up a hedge fund for my job. I know what I was going to do. I'll go ahead with that anyway, but do something a little different. So I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I, I've set it up in such a way where half of the fees, the management and performance fees go to charity and it's written into the prospectus of the fund. Um, and the reason I did that is because I think capitalism is getting a bad name amongst the younger generation, especially just the perception of capitalism. And the most capitalist thing of capitalism is like hedge fund managers that make billions of dollars and sit on these multi-billion dollar yachts or whatever, you know, like Wall Street and hedge fund managers, you know, and I want to be a part of this trend, you know, that's going on uh, called altruistic capitalism. And so I thought maybe if I can make my hedge fund very successful and become successful, 
I can help that trend grow, uh, especially amongst uh, Wall Street and hedge fund managers. Because if my hedge fund takes off, there'll be a lot of other emerging hedge fund managers that say, hey, I want to do something similar to good soil investment management and set up that, you know, maybe 10 or 20% of my fees go to charity automatically, you know, but ours is 50%. Um, so I think the more people that do that, the better chance we have at changing the perception and evolving capitalism so that there's not like a fast switch to socialism. You know, I think there's a place for UBI, universal basic income, but I think we'd have to do it smartly. I think um, if we do it, but I think there, in the next few election cycles, if we're not careful, the younger generations might just over, you know, overvote everyone else that, hey, we want more AOCs and in, in office. We want a bunch of them and just let's all just go to socialism, you know, and, 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 and have a government, a socialist government going forward. And I think that could be ruin our, our society. So I'm just trying to play a part in steering us away from that with, uh, with this and help people that need it, you know, so I donate to charities like uh, low income area um, education, I think is big, like charter schools. Um, also, uh, nutrition uh, guideline changes. I think there's a, a massive uh, obesity epidemic of you know diabetes and such in our in our Western society. People are kind of turning a blind eye to. I don't know why that wasn't one of Biden's pillars yesterday in his outline. Like, let's improve our health. You know, I feel like he he the most important thing is like let's all improve our physical health. That's like the best thing to have a better outcome if you get COVID. Um, you know, let's eat better. Let's go outside more and get some exercise or whatever it is. But health is just like, I think physical health, we focus too much on the symptoms and not the root causes. And uh, so I'm trying to donate in smart ways that, you know, address root causes of bigger societal issues, whether it's improving education um, or improving people's health through getting them educated early on with their nutritional guidelines or just get them, you know, all that stuff. So it's a whole thing. I like it. I'm, you know, that's the bigger mission. I want to make myself investors money, but the bigger mission is, is that, uh, and we are a hedge fund. So it's pretty high, uh, investor requirement to get in, but there are some institutional and family offices that we are, are talking to. And we've had substantial investors come in already. So it's, it's good. Eventually one day, I wouldn't mind setting up an ETF, a uh, good soil investment ETF, you can't do as much complex stuff in that. You can't do the fancy options trades I do or whatever. Um, and I'm not saying my investment return is always going to be great. I, I'm expecting to outbeat the S&P 500 over the uh, medium to long term. And I'm not purposely not too invested in Tesla because a lot of my uh, investors already are, are already invested in Tesla. And I tell people that's a great investment. If you want to diversify from that a little bit, we could be a risky option to invest in for diversification. But um, anyway, goodsoilinvestment.com has a lot more information, but, uh, yeah, thanks for giving me a chance to chat about that a little. Okay. And, and as it, are you working with Matt Smith? Yes. Matt Smith took on as a partner, uh, uh I think in March and he's been an excellent addition. We, we have our own little YouTube channel, good soil. Spark Investment. spread. No, that was his previous channel. Our channel is good soil investment. And so every Tuesday morning we do a live chat about the markets and then Tesla and some other stuff and take questions that's at 9.30 Pacific time, about an hour. We record it all and put it on our channel. Uh, so it's early on in early days of this YouTube channel, only a couple thousand subscribers, but uh, I think it'll grow over time. Okay, so just for the audience, I'm going to put links in the description below to Thanks. Good Soil Investment, the YouTube channel, and Good Soil Investment, the website, so you can check that out. You, you kind of got into politics a little bit, and I would just yeah. say, well, one thing I would say is, and I know you've said you don't read, but I think... <laughs> You might, you might want to read, read books. I like to read lots of stuff. Just oh, books. books. Have you read Ayn Rand? No, I don't read books. I don't read books. Okay. I, I read a couple of books here and there in the past, okay. but I just, I'm such a slow reader. I listen to a lot of podcasts. I'd rather listen to authors. I find talk. it, I find it funny that we need to defend capitalism. I, and I, and here's a real, just yeah. with my own kid, with my own yeah. kids, I have done this approach to defending capitalism and uh, avoiding re 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 the redistributive politics of the socialists and say, listen, you just got straight A's. Yeah. The principal is going to adopt a new policy where the kids who get D's, it's not fair that they're getting D's. So any kid who got like an A, their grade is going to be reduced to a B plus. And the yeah. kid who got a D, his grade is going to be reduced to a, a, a C minus. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that's a good idea? Why yeah. not? No. Well, why not? Well, I worked hard to get these grades. Okay. Yeah, that's good. That's a good analogy. I, I didn't make it up. Right. No, that, I, I didn't make that up. But I think if I like you it. read Ayn Rand's Fountainhead or Atlas Shrugged, and when I say, when you say you don't read books, these are hard slog books to read. 
Oh, that's, not, that's not my favorite. I fall asleep reading those. I'd rather not, I listen to audiobooks sometimes, but yeah. The I stories like Thomas, are really good. But you know the, Thomas Sowell, you listen read his books. I listen to his books. Thomas Sowell. Oh no, these are not these are fiction. Okay. Fiction. These book. are fiction oh, stories. Okay. And there is like Atlas Shrugged, the movie, like a three-part movie. Um okay. it's nowhere near as good as the book. If you read the book, the book is a really hard slog. Atlas Shrugged is the best, but it's okay. like a thousand pages. And okay. it's like, and like, there's like a 60 page monologue from one of the main characters. And it's like, all right, and I'm, a, I'm already a libertarian. It's sort of like, technically, Ayn Rand isn't libertarian. She's objectivist. That's a whole okay. uh, philosophical rabbit hole. We don't need to go down. But yeah. I'm basically already on the side of this. And like, yeah. I don't need to read this guy going in the 60 page diatribe about what's wrong with everything when I already agree with all that. I just yeah. want the story. So yeah. you, I'm like skipping through the monologue. All right, where's it get back to the story? Where's it go? Wow, 60 pages. Okay. So, um, but I think that if people read Ayn Rand, people will criticize Ayn Rand because they haven't read her, mm -hmm. right? If you actually read Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, then it's compelling, but you have to read it. If you just assume, oh no, she's about, you know, you know you're criticizing it without reading it. What do you know? So, yeah. and a few people will say they read it, but. All right. So, um, but politically like this, I think you mentioned Joe Biden. You were surprised. Like, I'm not surprised about any of it. I don't think we've had a good president. Like maybe Harry Truman's first term, <laughs> maybe Harry Truman's first term is like the last good president we've had in my book. Yeah. I'm bipartisan. I hate all of them. Yeah. So, um, all right. So you've given me a lot to think about. I want to thank you for, is there anything else you wanted to talk about before we wrap up? No, it's been a pleasure having, you know, you having me on. And uh, I think we have a chat in a few weeks, maybe scheduled with uh, uh, ADU. Uh, a Possible? No, no, a Sonderpods, remember uh, the... No, I thought uh, I have something in my messages about October 4th, but... Yes, yeah, Sonderpods, uh, the guy who is sort of like Boxable, but they're actually delivering units. Uh, okay. And uh, I've gone to see a couple, full disclosure, I've invested in them. It's a close friend of mine who set that sure. up. And, fascinating he knows all about the adus and the um issues that um there all right are. let's go down this path let's go down yeah. this path if you if you don't mind a few more minutes sure well, why don't we save that for october 4th he's the expert we'll talk about no. this all right, right all right all right we'll save it okay we'll save it. it'd be good okay yeah. yeah all right thank you very much for speaking with me uh please check out uh good soil investments the youtube channel and, and website in the links below i'd like to thank the vasa law firm in sweden and all my patreon supporters for helping this channel grow you can support this channel on Patreon here. Check out the t-shirts like Tesla is the next Tesla. That's right here. And check out a couple of my other videos up here. Thank you so much for watching.